If you're new here, welcome. Glad you're here. My name is Scotty James. I'm one of the pastors. Very glad you decided to spend your Sunday morning with us. Um, I missed you. We, we, my wife and family were gone at youth camp last week. It was a wonderful time. We have a very special group of youth, middle schoolers and high schools in this church. And so I'm uh, so blessed to be able to see firsthand just sort of what God is doing in them. And there's a real intimacy and a real spiritual depth, I feel like, is uh, in our youth. And when I say spiritual depth, I'm not talking about self-righteousness or we know more than other people. That's not what I mean. I think mean, there's a genuine desire to grow in the things of God that I see in our youth that isn't always super common. So I'm just really blessed to be able to be there and see them. Shout out to all the youth leaders who went. Let's give them all a hand for their work for that. It was a, it was a great time. If you're new here, we have a Connect card. We'd love to get connected with you. If you want to grab that and fill it out, it should be in the back seat pocket in front of you. If you want to put your name on there, drop it by the Welcome Center on the way out. We have a gift for you. And again, we just want to be connected and get to know you a little bit. Uh, one other quick announcement is in two weeks on October, excuse me, August 25th will be Water Day. Water Day is just a time for us to sort of close out the end of the summer with a celebration, you can bring your kids, tell them to bring uh, swimsuits after church because there'll be bounce houses and water slides out in the front. And we'll just have a little food, a little fellowship, and just kind of close out the summer together with some fun. So again, August 25th will be Water Day, and we hope that you'll join us for that. Amen? Amen. All right, now it's time to get into the Word. If you have a Bible, let's go to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. Verses 1 to 4. Romans 6, verses 1 to 4. Are we there? Okay, I'll pray. Thank you, God. Thank you. Thank you for this moment. What a wonderful opportunity we have here to gather with your people, to receive your word, to grow up in our faith. Thank you, God. May we take, take advantage of it. Please put us in the right frame of mind and frame of heart. Please protect us from going through motions. Protect us from zoning out. Protect us from checking off our religious box. Let this be a time of transformation, a time of intimacy. May we connect with you through this sermon. May we connect with you through your word. Increase our love for you, please. Increase our likeness to you. For those who are disconnected from you, would you please make them aware of that in this moment? We want this to be a, a, a time that has eternal impact on our souls. So we trust you for that. In the name of Christ, all God's people said together, amen. amen. Romans chapter 6, verse 1. It reads, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. We're going to unpack this verse by verse and then bring some application. So in order to understand what's going on here, we have to first understand the, the context, so to speak. So in Romans chapter 5, verse 20, Paul says, the law was brought in so that trespass might increase. But where sin increased, grace increased all the more. And so what Paul is saying, he's, he's touching on the impact of the Mosaic law. The Mosaic law is the Old Testament law given to Jews, the Ten Commandments, and all the laws that were associated with it. And so when the law was instituted, what happened was sins increased because now there was a clear standard to reveal sin. It'd be similar to if this road right here had no speed limit. If there was no speed limit on the road, there would be no speeding. But the second you instituted a speed limit, what you would find is that trespasses would increase. L violations would increase because now there's a clear standard to show that people are driving too fast. 
And this was part of the purpose of the law. When the law was instituted, sins increased because there was a clear standard to reveal the sinfulness of man. But the beautiful thing is that as sins increased, the scripture says that grace increased all the more. Because no matter how great man's sin is, God's grace is greater. That's what the Bible's talking about here. Imagine if you were to able to, to measure your sin in pounds. If you were to get all the, tally up all the bad things you've done and all the inappropriate thoughts you thought and all the mean things you said, if you were to tally all that up and put it in a box and put it on a scale, it wouldn't even begin to tip the scale of how heavy God's grace is. Because no, 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 no matter how heavy your sin is, God's grace is heavier. Think about this for a moment. No matter how busted up and broken and downright evil and wicked you are, God's grace is greater. So in, in light of this, in light of how great God's grace is, we come to Paul's question in verse number one. He says, shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? In other words, if the more I sin, the more it draws attention to how great God's grace is, then should I keep on sinning? It's, it's, it's the, the logic is, if I do something bad and it causes something good to happen, should I keep doing what's bad? Well, he gives us the answer in verse 2. What does it say? By no means. Circle that. By no means. No, you should not keep on sinning. And then he tells us why. He tells us the deeper reason, the, the deeper root of why. He says, by no means, we are those who have died to sin. Circle that in your notes. Those who have died to sin. That's who we are. How can we live in any longer? Christians are those who have died to sin. When you come into faith, you experience a relationship change with sin. You experience a, a change in your disconnection with sin. Anyone ever met someone who has broken up with someone, but they don't understand boundaries, they don't understand sort of how to move on? So they, they have an ex, but they still go over their ex's house to, to mow their grass, or they have an ex, but they still go over their ex's house to, to fix the sink or to pay their phone bill. That person doesn't understand that the relationship has changed. It's over. You're disconnected from them. You're separated. You're not together anymore. You broke up. Why are you living as if you're still in a relationship with them? And this is what the scripture is teaching us. When you came into faith in Christ, you broke up with sin. You separated from sin. You divorced from sin. Why would you live as if you and sin are still in a relationship? You're not. It's over. You've died to sin. And then in verse 3, Paul's going to go down a little bit deeper into what this relationship change with sin is, is centered in. Let's look at it. He says, or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? In your note circle, don't you know? Don't you know? When someone asks you a question and prefaces it with don't you know, what they're saying is that the answer to my question should be painfully obvious to you. Be like if we were going to, if you and a friend were going to, to Chick-fil-A and you had to get back somewhere quickly. And so you decided, you know what, let's, let's go to Chick-fil-A because the drive through should be no line there. And so you show up, and the line is four miles down the road. And your friend says, I can't believe there's a line in Chick-fil-A's drive through You might say, don't you know that Chick-fil-A always has a line in their drive through Right? That, that Chick-fil-A having a line in their drive through that's basic common knowledge that everyone should know, right? Not, not to be condescending, but everyone should know that Chick-fil-A has a line in their drive through even on Sundays, <laughs> right? Common knowledge. So when, when Paul says, don't you know, what he's saying is that, listen, 
What I'm about to tell you should be basic common knowledge. What I'm about to tell you should be, should be painfully obvious. What I'm about to say is fundamental to the Christian faith. In fact, if you don't understand what I'm about to say, you're probably, it's likely, you're not living the Christian faith the way it should be lived. It's a big deal. And look at what he says. Don't you know that all of us who are baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Now, wait a minute. I thought he said he was going to say something obvious. That doesn't seem that obvious to me. I don't think most Christians, like, understand that or that that just, just clicks. I would assume he would say, don't you know that God loves you? That's pretty obvious. Or, or don't you know that Jesus died for your sins? But don't you know that those who are baptized into Christ were baptized into death? That, that just doesn't land the way those other obvious statements do. Amen? But here's the problem. It should. It, it should. That statement should be obvious to us because that statement drives the whole Christian life, so to speak. It's going to be hard to live for God if you don't understand the significance of that statement. So let's unpack it for a minute. Go back to verse 3 if you don't mind. Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? In your notes, underline baptized into Christ. What does that mean to be baptized? Baptized into Christ. Well, in order to understand what that means, you've got to first understand what baptism means. This is worth writing down. It should be on the screen. Baptism. Baptism is all about identity. At the core of it, it's all about identity. Yes, having sins washed away, being born again, but central to this is identity. When someone's baptized, Baptism is a visual picture of the invisible reality that just took place. When someone comes to faith in Christ and is baptized, I say this almost every week, they did not just make a decision to follow Jesus. It is so much more than that. Through faith expressed in baptism, that person has become united with Christ in such a profound way that they have literally taken on his identity. I want you to picture marriage for a moment. Marriage is, is probably the most intimate, deeply connected union that happens on this earth with another person. And the connection is so deep in marriage that you have literally taken on that person's identity to a degree, and you have now become a participant in their life. And so when you get married, uh, the woman tends to take on the man's name. Both of you, whatever assets they have, you have taken on their assets. You have taken on their property. You have taken on their, their mood swings, You've, right? You've taken on their family drama. You've taken on whatever financial debts they have, whatever bank accounts they have. You have been united in such a profound way that you have become one with them in identity and have become a participant in their life. And marriage is actually a picture of what our union with Christ is. That's the purpose of marriage. The purpose of marriage is to provide a visible demonstration of the union we have with Christ. But here's the thing. Our union with Christ is, is even stronger than the marital union because the marital union lasts as long as you both shall live. But the union you have with Christ lasts for all of eternity. And so baptism is your wedding day. Baptism, baptism is the, the day in which you were married to Christ for all of eternity. And once again, this union, this baptism points to the grace of God because God did not need this relationship with you. That may sound harsh, but it's just the truth. God is gracious in entering into this marriage. You were not the catch in your relationship with God. I was not the catch in my relationship with God. God didn't need this relationship. God was not desperate for this relationship. God did not enter into this relationship because of any goodness on your part. It was solely out of his voluntarily grace that he entered into this relationship. So you are united to Christ. You have received his identity. And you have become a participant with him in his life by grace through faith in Christ. This is the gospel summed up. 
that you have been united in a mysterious way, united, become one with Jesus, become wed to him. You've taken on his identity. You're now a participant with him in his life, and it's all by his grace. And it comes through faith in him. And so to be baptized into Christ is to be united to him. And now when you're united to him, that means you're now baptized into his death. Underline that. You're baptized into his death. This is all about identity. Jesus died on the cross. Therefore, you died in a spiritual sense. This is why in verse 1, we're no longer to live to sin. Because we've died to sin. How? Well, I'm united to Christ. He died to sin on the cross. Therefore, I've died to sin. This is all about identity. Which is why Paul says, don't you know? He's speaking of your identity. The Christian life is not about just rules and do's and don'ts. And I do do this and I don't do that. It's centered in your identity. I don't sin because of my identity. I do good deeds because of my identity. I love my neighbor because of my identity. And I walk in the spirit, not in the flesh, because of my identity. And this is one of the biggest oversights in the church that really stems back to the spiritual leaders. We have failed to help people understand their identity. We've taught people to say yes to Jesus. We've taught them to repeat these prayers. We've taught them, we've, we've built big churches. We've written big books. But we fail, and I take part in this as a spiritual leader. We have failed to teach people who they are in Christ. And we have millions of people walking around writing Christianity on their survey who have no clue what that really means. We have an identity crisis. We have an identity crisis. And when you don't understand who you are, you live contrary to your identity. If you, if, I was watching this news clip, and there was this guy grazing grass and chewing up grass, acting like a, a, a goat, and you know, the, the commentators or the, the analysts, whatever they're called, the, what are, I know commentators are sports, but what, what is it? News anchor. They were sort of laughing and giggling because this guy's eating grass. Well, what's so funny about that? He doesn't know who he is. He has an identity crisis. He's acting like a goat, but he's a grown man. Grown men don't, don't eat grass on all fours. It's an identity issue. And in the church, when we live contrary to how we're supposed to live, when we walk in sin, when we think like the world, we have an identity issue. We don't understand that's not who we are. That's not how we think. That's not how we behave. We've got to know who we are. And so my question for you is this, do you know who you are? Like seriously, as a Christian, do you understand who you are, because who you are, your identity is what everything in your Christian life is, is going to flow from. We're going to spend maybe the next week or two sort of unpacking this. Who, who are we in Christ, and what are the implications? What should flow from us because of our identity? That's what we're going to look at for the next few weeks, but today I'm going to just point out something that's very obvious from this, this scripture here. So let's go back to verse 1, please. It says, what shall we say? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. For those who have died to sin, how can we live in any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Here's the result of your identity. The identity you've received from Jesus, this is what the fruit of that should be. Holiness. Holiness. Because you are in Christ, you should live a new life of holiness. Go to verse 4 in your notes. Circle new life. Live a new life. That is the result of your union with Christ. Your, your marriage to him. It should result in you living a new life of holiness. Now, I've already touched on this a little bit. Well, because you're married to Jesus, your relationship with sin is dead. You broke up, you divorced. But I need you to understand this. Your relationship with sin now, it's, it's hostile now. 
There's animosity between you and sin. You're not flirtatious with sin. You despise sin. You downright hate sin. There's beef between you and sin. You don't like sin. You don't get along with sin because you're married to Christ. When you look throughout the scripture, you'll notice that the relationship that God has with sin and the relationship that his people have with sin, it's not friendly. It's not flirtatious. It's downright hate. Write down Psalm 101, verses 1 to 4. Psalm 101. Listen to how David, a man after God's own heart, listen to how he views sin. He says, I will sing of your love and justice. To you, Lord, I will sing praise. I will be careful to lead, to lead a what? Blameless life. What's a blameless life? Sinless. A life devoid of sin. A life separated from sin. I'll live a blameless life. When will you come to me? I will conduct the affairs of my house with what? A blameless heart. I'm not flirting. My heart's not going to flirt with sin. It's not going to delight in sin. It's not going to justify sin. I don't want any part of sin. Keep reading. I will not look with approval on anything that is vile. You think David is entertaining himself with sinful content? You think David partakes in sin for entertainment? No. He wants nothing to do with it. Because he wants to follow rules? No, because of his relationship with God. He's united to God in such a way that the things that offend God offend him. This is about relationship. He says, I will hate what faithless people do. I will have no part in it. The perverse of heart shall be far from me. I will have nothing to do with evil. Do you guys see it? Or am I just preaching to no one here? He wants nothing to do with sin. Why? Because he's united to God. His heart is after God's. And the things that offend God now offend him. God has beef with sin. Therefore, David has beef with sin. Write down Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 to 5. I think Pastor Matt touched on this a little bit last week. This is all about identity and union. In fact, when you start to understand how central identity is, you'll start to read the Bible differently. And this will give you an example right here. Colossians 3, verse 1. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Pause there. Raised with Christ. What does that mean? Somebody tell me. New life. Why? Identity. That's why. You've been raised. How were you raised? You didn't raise from the dead. No, but because of your union with Christ, you've become a participant in his life. So when he rose from the dead, guess what? In a spiritual sense, you did too. You've been raised with Christ. This is about identity. So because you've been raised with Christ, because of your new identity, now this is what you're supposed to do. Set your heart on things above. Well, Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above. Not on earthly things. For you died. Pause. You didn't die. How'd you die? Why? Identity. Exactly. Through your union with Christ, you have died to sin. This is all about identity. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ. How is it hidden with Christ and God? Your identity. Are you seeing it or no? When Christ, who is your life, appears, how is Christ your life? Through your identity. You've become one with him. You've become a participant with him in his life. And now when he appears, guess what? You will appear with him in glory as well. So the first four verses were all about identity. Now it's about what are you supposed to do because of your identity. Look at it, verse 5. Canoodle, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Is that what it says? <laughs> Hug and caress and kiss all over your earthly nature? What does it say? Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Kill whatever belongs to your sinful nature. I'm being aggressive, but I want you to understand this is what the Bible is telling you. 
Be aggressive with your earthly nature. Murder your earthly nature. Why? You're married now. You're married to Christ. If a man goes out and canoodles with women who, while he's married, he is violating that relationship. If a woman goes around flirting with men while she's married, she has violated that relationship. And as believers, we are not to date sin. We are not to flirt with sin. We're not to caress and maintain fellowship with sin. We're to put it to death because you're married. You're married. It's not about rules. It's about relationship. When people say that and put that on bumper stickers, this is what that actually means. Because of my relationship with God, because I love him, I'm putting to death the things that put him on the cross. That's what the scripture is teaching us. Write down 1 Peter 2, 24. First Peter 2, 24. He himself, talking about Jesus, he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might flirt with sins. No. So that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. One more. Galatians 6, 14. If you write it down, it'll be up on the screen. Galatians 6, 14. Talking about our relationship change with sin. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Do you see the relationship change that Paul is saying here? I've been crucified to this world, and this world has been crucified to me. I want nothing to do with the sinful world system, with the sinful I want nothing to do with it. I've died to that stuff because it's about following rules. No, because I'm married to Christ. I've wed him. We're in union together. I'm not going to cheat on him and commit adultery. This marriage to Christ is meant to produce a new life of holiness. But, 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 there are two things in the church that prevent us. There's probably more than two, but there's two very prevalent things in the church that prevent us from living this new life of holiness. This new life of of unity and oneness that God has called us to. And I don't think they're intentional. I think they're actually unintentional. But they're barriers to us living in the new life that God has called us to. Here they are. One is a bad strategy, and the other one is a bad culture. Bad strategy, bad culture. It prevents us from living the new life that we're called to live. By bad strategy, I mean the method the way in which we seek to go about living this new life, it doesn't work. But it's the way that most of us try to live out this this Christian faith. And I'll give you a quick parable to sort of explain what I'm talking about here. All right, I want you to meet Adrian. I use Adrian intentionally because it's a unisex name. For the women, think of Adrian as a woman. For the men, think of Adrian as a man. Adrian is, is not in the faith. Adrian is disconnected from God. Adrian's a good American, says the Pledge of Allegiance, pays their taxes, does kind things, but still is disconnected from God because of Adrian's sin. Well, one day Adrian decides to go to church because Adrian was invited, to, uh, invited by a friend. So Adrian comes, and Adrian has a good experience. The pastor gives a you know, subpar, inspiring message. The music was okay, and the donuts were free, and the people were nice. So Adrian says, you know what, this isn't that bad. I think I'll, I can come back here. So Adrian comes back. Adrian has another good experience. Adrian comes again, has another good experience. So on the fourth or fifth time, Adrian says, you know what? I, I, I want to sort of do this Christian thing. And so the pastor is giving his sermon, and at the, the end, he, he gives the gospel invitation to receive Christ. And Adrian says, you know what? I'm going to do this. So Adrian raises his or her hand or repeats the prayer, comes to the front, does whatever the pastor says to do, and Adrian becomes a Christian. And Adrian starts to feel feelings excitement and and joy and all the pleasant feelings that should come with that sort of thing. Here's the thing. Adrian has no clue what it means to live for God, no clue of what it means to walk in the Spirit, but Adrian does know this. I'm supposed to live a new life. I'm supposed to do things differently now. I'm supposed to stop doing the bad stuff and start doing the good Christian stuff, which is accurate. So Adrian starts off the gate, and he or she is killing it. They stop cussing, and they, they 
broke up with that unhealthy relationship and they stopped sinning. But two or three weeks into it, it starts to get a little harder. Uh, that old relationship starts to, Adrian starts to miss that relationship and start to, starts to miss that sin and starts to miss that drink and, you know, miss that smoke. But Adrian white knuckles it and perseveres and uses self-discipline and suppression and makes it to another Sunday. But the next week's a little bit harder. Adrian ends up giving in and committing that sin. And Adrian feels terrible because he or she's supposed to live this new life. So that next Sunday, the, the pastor gives a, a call for accountability partners. And Adrian thinks, you know what, that's what I need. I need an accountability partner. So Adrian gets connected with a, a seasoned Christian, male or female. And that Christian meets with him and says, listen, Adrian, if you're ever going to sin, just call me and I'll help you overcome it. So Adrian thinks, yes, this is what I need. But, but Adrian struggles and sins again and confesses it to the accountability partner. The accountability partner is discouraged because they've got to find a way for Adrian to stop doing this sin. So the accountability partner comes with a good idea. He says, okay, we're going to meet every week, and I'm going to ask you if you did that sin every week. And if you did, I want you to give me $20. <laughs> now, this, that sounds funny. I, I'm embarrassed to say I've done this. I have done this very thing. The goal wasn't for the accountability partner to get $20. Right? The goal was to help Adrian stop doing this sinful behavior. So Adrian pays $20 probably once every two or three weeks and, and you know, is losing money, but sort of getting better at it. And this goes on for years and years. And, and Adrian still has that burning desire, but Adrian, for the most part, has learned to, to really manage that behavior and sort of keep it in wraps for, you know, under check, so to speak. So my question is, first off, this is super common. This is probably most people's journey, just so you know. Was that a win? Was, was that the new life of holiness that God desires? Is, is that what our union with Christ is supposed to produce? If, if I could borrow a phrase from Paul, by no means, by no means. Now some of us think that makes sense, but the reality is that's not what our cultures reflect. Most of our cultures, that, that is a win. Most of our cultures, that, that, that is holiness. But if you think that's what holiness is or if that's what spiritual maturity is, really what that shows is that you think God is more interested in your behavior than in your heart, and that's not true. God is actually more interested in our hearts than in our behaviors. What happened to Adrian is that he isn't or she is not dying to sin they're not becoming more holy. They're not becoming more like Jesus. Really what they're becoming is a professional Christian. Seriously. They're learning how to hide their behaviors and manage their sin. That's what's happening. They're, they're undergoing behavior modification. And when you see holiness or growth in Christ-likeness as merely behavior modification, what you do is you create a community of people who are skilled in suppression, skilled in self-discipline, who know how to manage their behaviors, but who are never experiencing the true depths of transformation from the inside out that God really desires. You're forming groups of people who know how to behave, groups of people who know how to act, who know how to perform, but who are not being renewed from the inside out the way Christ really desires. It's called surface level holiness. That's what they're experiencing. It's like a person who's addicted to cigarettes. And so to overcome cigarettes, they start drinking coffee. You do realize that nothing really happened, right? There was no transformation in that. All you did was you exchanged one vice for a more acceptable vice. But the deeper root of what's leading to that was never really dealt with. But oftentimes we celebrate that as holiness. We celebrate that as spiritual maturity because we're fixed on the behaviors, but we fail to see that this spiritual thing, this walking with Jesus thing, is supposed to be a soul thing that we're undergoing. Write down Matthew 23, verse 25. Matthew 23. And I'm not trying to be condemning or condescending. This was me. This was my perspective for years. It's all about just behaviors. Don't do this anymore. Start doing this and you're holy. And I missed the entire point or very much of the point. 
Look at uh, Matthew 23. Verse 25, or write it down. It says, Jesus talking, he says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you're full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup, and then the outside will be clean as well. Are you getting what he's saying? Verse 27, Woe to you, teachers of the law, Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. Listen, Jesus is highlighting the fact that true holiness, true holiness comes from the inside out. True holiness is not about just modifying behaviors and doing things differently. True holiness comes from a transformation of the heart and mind that manifests itself in the change of behavior. The Pharisees did everything right externally, but they lacked internal holiness. And they might be a drastic example because they were wicked, but the same is true with us in the church. We may have been born again, but God desires more than just modifications in our behavior. He wants those modifications of behavior to come from the renewal of our heart and mind. And so our strategy is bad. Our strategy is this. Suppression and self-discipline will lead us to become more like God, and that's not true. Suppression and self-discipline are based in self-reliance. And self-reliance is not able to produce the newness of the soul that God desires. You have to exchange your strategy of self-reliance to God-reliance, and this is what life in the Spirit is all about, church. This is why I've been preaching over this for the past several weeks. Self we need to exchange our strategy of self-discipline for surrender. Life in the Spirit is all about surrender, becoming aware of what God wants and surrendering to him, relying upon his strength. That's what life in the Spirit is all about, and that's, where the, that's the pathway towards true holiness. And so awareness and surrender to God's word Awareness of the enemy's schemes. Awareness of, of the spiritual battle that you're in. Awareness and surrender of your emotions and feelings. Awareness and surrender of your thoughts and beliefs. Awareness of what you're thinking and knowing how to renew your mind. That is life in the spirit, and that's what will lead you toward the pathway of true inner holiness that God desires for you. And all of that, again, is centered in your identity. It is all about identity. So I ask you again, as we sort of prepare to, to, to close and receive communion, do you know who you are? Seriously. Do you know who you are and what should flow from that because of that? Do you know who you are and do you know how to, how to live out this identity? For our, our soul work this week, we're, we're not going to add anything more because one of the challenges is you can, I feel like week after week we have you know, more, more things to sort of appropriate, but a lot of this stuff takes even years to sort of get your hands around. And so I don't want to give us too much to where we're not able to do anything. So we're going to take another week and just drill down on some of the things we've already talked about. So for Soul Week, this is what I encourage you to write down. Number one, this is, this is how we're going to make this sermon applicable to our lives by faith. I want you to continue to identify your thoughts and identify your feelings. Work on those two things. What am I feeling? Emotion. What am I thinking? What's the thought that's connected to it? I want us to keep working on that and keep talking about that with people in our lives. What am I feeling? What am I thinking? It's the first thing. Okay, have you written that down? I'll give you five more seconds. Write that down. You're not writing it down. You should be writing it down. <laughs> okay, second thing. After you identify your emotions from your feelings, second thing is I want you to practice surrender through scripture memorization. Remember, you renew your mind with the truth of God's word. So practice surrender through scripture memorization. And here's the scripture I want you to memorize. Write it down, Romans 6, verses 1 to 4. It's the scripture on that passage right there, on your bulletin. It's already written down for you. Romans 6, verse 1 to 4. I want to encourage all of us to memorize that. You still with me? Now, here's an opportunity for us to practice what we've been preaching. 
When I said memorize that verse and you looked at the verse, I'll guarantee some of you started feeling feelings. <laughs> right? You started feeling anxious, started feeling nervous, started feeling afraid, maybe frustrated because of the thoughts you were thinking. You started thinking, I can't memorize this big passage. You started thinking, I don't have the time to memorize this passage, or it's not necessary for me to memorize this passage. You started feeling feelings because of the thoughts you were thinking. So we're going to apply the sermon in real time right now. Life in the spirit, awareness and surrender, aware of what you're feeling, aware of what you're thinking, and then when you're thinking something that's not true, you renew your mind by replacing that thought with something that's true of God's word. So for those of us who thought, I don't have time to memorize this scripture, is it true that you don't have time to memorize the scripture? No. It's not true. It's not true. You're believing a lie. For those who thought, I can't memorize the scripture, it's too much. Pause. Is it true that you don't have the ability to memorize that scripture? No. You're believing a lie. Now, if you don't want to, it's fine. Don't. But I don't want us to be a people who are content to just live in lies. If you don't want to, that's one thing. But you can't? No, you can. You don't have time? No, you do have time. So whether you want to or not, that, that's on you. But we're, we're practicing what we're preaching now. I want to encourage you. You can memorize the scripture, and you should memorize the scripture. It's going to take time. I'm not saying it's going to be easy. I'm not going to say it's, it's going to be super comfortable. But I am saying this, if you want to grow in Christ's likeness, it's going to take some effort. Your effort, not by itself, it's not self-reliance, but your effort in conjunction with God's grace is how his character will be manifested in you. So I want to encourage you to memorize that scripture, that whole thing, because it's foundational for the Christian life. We're going to be building on it deeper and deeper. And so, yeah, it's going to take some work. Verse 1, should, should we continue sinning so that grace may abound? By no means. Right? You're already a fourth of the way then. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live it any, any longer? You're already halfway there. So it's, it's, it's I'm not saying it's easy, but I'm keeping it real. It's, it's, it's not that hard either. We're able to do it. Amen? Amen. 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 So I want to encourage us to do that. Now, baptism is all about identity, but so is communion. When one receives communion, what they're saying is that I am one with Christ. His body was broken for my sin, his blood was shed for my sin, and I have been united with him through faith. So you might look at baptism as your wedding with Christ, and communion is your anniversary. It's not once a year, but it's sort of your ongoing sacrament to show I am in the faith, I am one with Christ, I am a participant in his life, and I belong to him. So as we prepare to see communion, I want you to approach it from that standpoint. I, I'm united to Christ, and this is why I receive these elements. Which is also why, if you are not in the faith, this is, this is, this is not for you. you, you you're, you're not one with him. This, isn't, this is something for you to just sit back and sort of appreciate and observe. Don't feel awkward, because there's going to be other people who, who aren't participating as well. But this, this sacrament is really only for those who are in the faith, who have put their faith in Jesus, who have married him. And this is a symbol saying, I, I'm, I'm still married to Christ. I'm still committed to this relationship. So let's pray. Those who are united to Christ, those who have been baptized into Christ, have been baptized into his death. God, would you please help that register with us? Help us to realize that the Christian life is all about identity. It's all about identity. And as we prepare to receive this, these elements, uh, we do it with, with appreciation. Thank you that through faith you have graciously imparted your identity and your life unto us. Thank you, God. Please help us apply all the things that we've looked at that we might walk in the spirit. We don't want to be a church that just simply focuses on behavior change. We want to experience true holiness, and that will only come through life in the spirit. Please grow us up and help us do these things. Please prepare our hearts to receive communion uh, in the right way. It's in Christ's name we pray. Everybody sit together. Amen.